We are live. I'm not even going to play the music. That's just, that. That's how raw this conversation is going to be. Oh, hey. I want. Mu- There's no entry music, James. Come on, I need <laughs> like some Shania Twain. You I got to play some. Are you Shania kidding Twain. me? I can't afford Shania Twain. You know what the copyright licensing on that is? You've <laughs> got to be kidding me. Isn't it I- under thirty? No. 10 seconds? You don't have to pay copyright? I don't know what... Yeah, that's the thing. I don't think anybody actually knows. I think everybody's making up copyright numbers and rules all day long. And my gotcha. challenge is I got to take this conversation and stick it on YouTube. And they, like, look at everything. And I'm like, okay, look, I'm just going to keep it safe, keep it easy. Uh, hey, everybody. No welcome, music, then. Yeah, yeah no welcome music to then. the We're Not Shania Twain conversation. This is, the, <laughs> this is a biotech chat. So you've actually turned in, tuned into the right place. I'm James Ellis of Employer Brand Labs. With me is... My friend, former co-worker, Daniel Benavides of Recursion out of Salt Lake City. He is the head of talent acquisition at Recursion. He's doing done that job about a year now. That sounds about right. Like yeah, that. just a little over a year. A smidge more. Yes, been with uh, Recursion for about two and a half, but in this role for about a year. Yes. Yeah. So, I, you, know, you know, each conversation is going to be a little different. So I think today what I'd love to start with is... You, um, most TA leads come from either they're manage, managing recruiters or recru- you know senior recruiter, or they're an HRBP and they got like got shifted over because there was a vacancy. You sure. came from talent ops, and talent ops is not your normal feeder system into head of talent acquisition. And I'm not going to say if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'd like to start this conversation by saying, how does coming from talent ops change your perspective on hiring at a biotech? Yeah. No, and absolutely. And James, I think that's a really fantastic question because it's so interesting the way I think even talking with anybody where they'll ask you, like, how did you get into recruiting? Right. And everybody always falls into it, regardless of who you talk to. You're going to folks fall into the role and then they move into it. Um, And I come from. So before I got into ops, like I was doing I ran a desk, I ran. led a team of corporate and technical recruiters and then move and then all throughout all of those roles i had a piece of operations that was in it and then this role truthfully um when i started at recursion about two and a half years ago was the first time that i was running operations specifically and it was it's this we it's a very interesting dynamic because years ago i was an analyst and i thought i was going to be an analyst forever moved into recruiting and then being able to morph my love of recruiting and then my love of like all things Excel and my team laughs at me because I'm like, there's nothing better than writing an Excel query and it works the first time, every time. There's nothing, nothing better. Um, But being able to kind of morph the two worlds into operations like that, it was, it was such an incredible role and being able to make an impact here at recursion. Like I did in the year and a half that I was in that role. Um, Truthfully, James, to your, back to your question, set me up for success in this talent acquisition lead role. And I, what I mean by that is being able to understand, like, you have the recruiting function, right? You're running a desk, we're sourcing, we're talking to candidates, but then also on the back end, talent acquisition is a process, right? From point A to point B to point C. And then how do we just ensure that that's like a well-oiled machine, right? And we've all heard this in talent acquisition, time kills all deals. So I would hate that it's like, you know, we are waiting from an operations perspective for an offer to go out or it's stuck in approval or it's, or it's all of those kind of things. So being able to see like the full picture, because I think some folks that move from like, I'm running a desk, I move into a, a corporate a recruiting manager type role, and then I move into the lead of talent acquisition, they're missing that whole side of the operations Um, And I think there's bits and pieces of it that are going to come into it, but being able to morph the two that I've been able to do is just ensuring like, okay, I know the pain points of my recruiters. I know the pain points of my coordination team. I know the pain points of our hiring managers and our hiring teams. Like, how do we just ensure that this is a smooth process from A to Z and that we've got, we continue to pull exceptional talent in um, and that we're quick, right? Not that we're cutting corners or anything like that, yeah. but that we can get the right people in here. Um, we're assessing them appropriately. We are following a process. Uh, everything is in our ATS system. Or we're leveraging our ATS system to its fullest, right? Mm-hmm. Because that's a lot of things like yeah. folks will buy an ATS system. I just talked to to our account manager yesterday and a lot of folks will just buy a system out of the box and then just leave it like, yeah, we're using it the same, but it's not. So like seeing the operations side of things where I was solely responsible for that and then being able to make sure that we were leveraging it the way. So there's a piece of me right now that also is like, there's a new, like, let's automate, let's leverage new systems. Let's leverage Mm -hmm. new technologies to 
just make talent acquisition and the recruitment ex and hiring manager experience just top notch, right? Yeah. So that's where long answer, James, but like that's a big piece of me is like being able to see both sides and then morph that into one has been, it's been incredible. Um, yeah. And not saying that folks who don't that operation side like I do can't, um, but I yeah. think it's a, it definitely is a leg up for me just knowing and seeing the full picture of recruiting because there's those two, like you have the front facing and then you have the back end and I've been able to see both of them to be able to move us forward, which has been really nice. So you're kind of, you know, if I can put words in your mouth and you apologize sure. for this, but you know, what the heck, um, you're really looking at recruiting as a system or a systemic function that it's not just, you know, stuffing a pipeline full and seeing what happens. It's, it's the machinery, it's the process, it's the, the, how do you get from A to Z and making sure it automates and runs repeatedly and smoothly. And, you know, once it does, then how do you review that process? Say, where are the places where there's lag? Where are the places where we can streamline and shorten and, and processitize? Where is a recruiter who comes from a world of how do I be attractive online? How do I be interesting online? How do I engage with someone in a very human kind of way? That's not systems approach. That's that's right. that's retail conversations, which is it's, it's it's incredibly powerful skill, but different from what you have, you know, what you're bringing to the table. Do you feel like there's any friction between recruiters who aren't, are, you know, usually recruiters are the least systemic people I've ever met, and <laughs> I mean that positively what? because that's their job. Right. Their job is to think in people. Their job is to be the people people, right? You're right, coming at course. it from this. Yeah. You're coming from a systems point of view. Is there friction or what does that friction look like? Not in a negative way, but you know, how do you kind of see it manifest where recruiters have wants and desires and ways of, of looking at things and you're driving in a different way? Yeah, I think, and I, and <clears throat> good question, James. And I think going to I wouldn't say it's friction, but okay. it's very much like as a recruiter, why would I do that? Like, why would you slow mm. me down to like document something in an ATS or why would you slow me down to be able to post it on this website or something like that? Like, I just want to get on LinkedIn. I want to pick up the phone and have conversations with people. Like what, why is that? And it's very much having relationships with your recruiters, I think is a big piece, right? Not that I'm yeah. just going to come in and people hear me say this all the time. Like, I'm not that guy that's just going to come in and change things just for the sake of changing. Like, oh, this is fun for me, right? I think having a relationship with your entire talent acquisition team, as well as your business leaders from the yeah. perspective of um, like, help me help you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like, I am not doing this just because I love Excel and process and all of those kind of things. Like, as you're looking at it, it's like, this is going maybe to a little make bit. your, maybe a little bit, or maybe a little <laughs> bit, but like, this is going to make the process, the candidate experience, your experience as a recruiter so much easier in the long mm, run. Yeah. And so like that is bringing them along the journey rather than just like, I'm going to shove a process in your face. It's like, let's talk about this. I want to hear your feedback. This is my feedback. These are my recommendations. Here's your recommendations. And then we can build this together so that it's not just me saying like, oh, this is my process. This is why I think we should do it. Like, let's bring everybody along the entire journey so that we can land on something that is helpful. Um, and then I think looking at pieces from like a systems thinking approach, James, like you were just mentioning, there are things that we will look at around like, okay, process X, like, hey, this on this rec, it took us. I don't know, an additional four or five days. Where was that? Let's dig into that. Yeah. Or like, can we change this? Can we pivot this? Like all of those kind of things. And so having those conversations with your recruiters is so invaluable because it's, it's not just me pushing a process. It's we're working on this together. And I think that goes a long ways, truthfully. So there yeah. is friction. Um, I wouldn't call it necessarily like we're butting heads, yeah, but I yeah. think it's, it's pulling people along that journey with you. Yeah. It sounds like, so, you know, when you're trying to apply a process or trying to look at a process to a recruiter, who's just trying to run and gun and get it done every step and every additional step that they don't feel like they need to do is slowing you, slowing them down. But what you can see is a bigger picture. Once we collect those data points, we can start to find additional ways to streamline process. So it's actually in the long run, much, much, much shorter. Exactly. Um, yeah, so, oh, I had a question and I lost it. Oh, that's right. It'll come back to me. Um, so in terms of, is there value in coming from a talent ops point of view in terms of talking with leadership? One of my kind of pet theories is that recruiters 
their metrics do not line up with how the business thinks. Time to fill, number of applications, that is all blah, blah, blah to a leader who goes, did it make me money? Did it save me money? Did it get us new customers? Did it lower our risk? Did it stroke my ego? The only things leaders care about, the five things. Um, it, it's, I mean, that's just, I'll stand by that. I have yet to find anybody who can say there's a that's six thing, but it's like- To James, ish. that's trademark. Oh, I, that, one day, <laughs> one day. I got, you heard yeah. it here first, right? Yes. <laughs> no, you did not. I say it a lot. Uh, save money, make okay. money, save money, get customers, lower risk, stroke ego. That's all leaders care about. But that's does, okay. does coming from a talent ops you know, position where you do think in Excel spreadsheets, does that make the conversation with leadership in the aggregate, not just your specific boss, but leaders in, in general, does it make it easier? Or does it make it harder? Or does it change expectations? I think it's... I think it makes it easier, but I would not say, James, it's because of a talent operations background. Okay. I would say it is because, like, recursion. We're an incredibly data-driven organization. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I would say probably in all of my roles, we're, we're pretty data-driven. Like, there's the data doesn't lie. That's what I always say, right? Like, there's proof in the data. Let's look at it. Let's look at the, the funnel, the metrics, all of those kind of things. And that's where I think coming from a talent operations background, I think it adds it adds some value to it, but it's not, mm -hmm. it's not everything, right? And so that's where I want to say folks that are listening to this are kind of dialing in that it's not, you do not have to have an operations background to get the kind of ear of your senior leadership team from a talent acquisition perspective. I think there's pieces of it that are going to pull in like that you're prepared. You're going into a t an intake meeting and it's like, Hey, James, you're a hiring manager. 18 months ago, we hired this role and it took us 97 days. Let's dissect that process on yeah. the 90th, you know, on day 45, like candidates sat in this stage for 30 days. Like, what was that? How can we get through that? Like, you know, and this is, so as you're pulling that in, and leading with that data, I think managers will see that. And again, some folks will think like, oh, time to fill is our biggest one. Or like, mm -hmm. how many candidates do I have in the pipeline? Like all of those kind of things. But helping your senior leaders understand the full picture of the recruitment funnel is incredibly helpful. And that's where I think from a talent ops perspective is we can adjust process, we can talk through process, but also as the talent acquisition leader that I am embedding that data in with my recruiters, like giving them access to our uh, behind the scenes data in our ATS mm -hmm. system. We have a system that sits on top of our ATS that um, is a data visualization tool that folks can use to kind of lean into that. Um, because I think the more that you give your recruiters the data, the power to have those conversations to move folks through with your hiring leaders, that's so invaluable. And so I think, James, to your question, there is a piece of that that's valuable coming from talent ops, but you do not have to have that background in order to lead with that data when you're sitting down with your hiring leaders. That makes sense. That makes sense. Do you think that because you're working in biotech and uh, in a kind of company that is trying to um, change the way drug development, drug discovery is happening, they're, they're looking for new ideas, that, they are, that they're the kind of company like many other biotechs where you say, okay, let's take some bioscience, but let's also glue it to data science or let's glue it to optics or let's glue it to fluorescence. Like well, there's, there's so much kind of like, uh, not, not concatenation, but kind of integration of thinking that this is an audience who wants to hear the data, especially, whereas, you know, if you're in an, another organization, they might not appreciate the kind of data you're bringing to the table as much. Do you think biotech is especially data driven and a data, uh, not what's the opposite of data phobic data, data philic? Is that the, is that data? What? Data phobic? I think that's, no, that, that's negative. I want data liking. I really appreciate liking? and values. It. Yeah. Da yeah. I think it's good question, James. I think it, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, like I mentioned, there's a lot of companies where I've come in throughout my background that are data, data driven. Recursion is probably the most data driven company okay. I've been at. Um, with just like that's, you know, we're using artificial intelligence and machine learning to speed up the drug discovery process, like you said, James. So we are looking at numbers, um, large, incredible amounts of data all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where it's like the date. We want the data. We want to yeah. see the data. We want to see all those kind of things. But is it necessarily like our identifier or game changer? I wouldn't say so because like the, in biotech, tech bio type organizations, like we, recursion itself, like we are disrupting an industry. I'm not saying that data is gonna disrupt the talent acquisition process, but I think leading forward with that data is so, <clears throat> excuse me, is so invaluable because it's gonna tell the story through mm -hmm. every aspect of things. So I think 
loving that data, leading with that data. And I think there's other parts of it where sometimes hiring managers think like, oh, my time to fill is the only metric I need, like pulling through all of the types of things that you can going deeper, paint that full pick. Yeah. Go deeper with your teams and help them understand like where that's coming from. Mm. Because again, going back to those five things you mentioned, James, some people may think like time to fill the amount of folks I have at the top of the funnel, like all of those kind of things. That's just one part of the equation. Like let's look at how long candidates are sitting in a stage how long it takes for candidates to schedule, how long it takes for us to move from, you know, time to our, um, the time they apply to the time they offer, like all of those types of things. So there's just so much invaluable data that you can look at. And I think at Recursion, um, we're, we're moving in that direction where we're going to have those types of conversations with hiring leaders, but I wouldn't say it's anything that we've had like in our back pocket the entire time I've been here, but it's, we're moving in that direction. So Okay, so let's change gears a little bit because so every, everybody knows in biotech, the two major hubs are Cambridge, Boston, and the Bay Area. You are, you know, you're in Salt Lake City. That is not one of the hubs. Though I am noticing that there are a lot of companies in Colorado and Austin and Canada and like these these kind of like secondary hubs, Seattle, LA, that there's a lot of companies coming up that are not in one of those hubs. How does not being in one of those major biotech centers change your approach to recruiting and hiring? Yeah, I think it's, it's so interesting because people think like, oh, tech bio or biotech, you're not in, you're not on the coast. Like you're in Salt Lake City. Like we were just at a conference. um, It was back in July, James, last time we connected and people were like, oh, so you're in Boston. We're not. (laughs) We're in Salt Lake City. Um, And I think so we've been here, we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary. We've been headquartered here in Salt Lake City those entire 10 years. Um, and so there's a big piece that, that is a part of our recruitment philosophy is that we're re- obviously we're reaching out to those folks that sit in those hubs to pull them in. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of time, not, I wouldn't say a lot of times, but there are times where candidates will say like, you want me to move where? Yeah. Um, and I will tell you right now, you know, born and raised here in Utah, Salt Lake city is a great place, right? Cost of living, the sense of community, like all of those kind of things. And so it's arming our recruiters to have those conversations with those potential candidates. And so I think there's a piece of it where, you know, are we leveraging LinkedIn to kind of say like, okay, maybe did somebody go to school here? So then we can reach out to them and like, did you miss the snow? Do you miss this? Like, where are these types of things? But I think beyond that, I think it's helping folks understand that Salt Lake City is up and coming and could be the next hub, like a South San Francisco or a Cambridge or all of those kind of things. And so James, I think there's places where you were just mentioning places popping up in Canada, Denver, you know, all of those kind of things and those will pop up. But I think it's, it's bringing folks into a condensed area beyond those coastal cities to kind of say like, Salt Lake's a great place. Utah's a great place. Like let's make this the next tech bio hub as we're moving this forward. Um, and we have incredible talent here and it's Utah's a great place. You know, we've got red rocks, three hours South. We have four ski resorts within, and I'll get off my salt Lake city soapbox, <laughs> but like four ski resorts within 45 minutes of the office, like all of these types of things that we can do. And so like having that conversation with folks that are like, wait, I've never been to Utah. You have that type of stuff. I can afford this. I can do these types of things. And so it's, it is different, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's the right kind of different as we're pulling folks into Salt Lake city and having those conversations. Um, you know, there's a combination of our roles that we'll do hybrid. So folks are remote and then they'll come in and, and vice versa. But a majority of it is like, we would, we have wet labs here. We would love to have folks here in Salt Lake city. And there's just a great, vibe and culture here in our office in Salt Lake. So I think pulling folks in that way and having those conversations um, and recruiting folks that can come from those areas into here is, is um, a big piece of why we do it. And I think it's, I think it's more than 20% of our organization over the, over the years has moved to Salt Mm -hmm. Lake for recursion. So as we're continuing to do that, and as, as Utah continues to evolve, like bringing folks in so that there's more sense of community, because there may be folks that are like, You know, and um, diversity and equity inclusion, James, not to take us down uh, pivoting here, but like that's incredibly important to me and is near and dear to my heart as I've led programs here, led programs at previous roles. But like a lot of folks may think like there's not a sense of community or like my people, the the way I identify, the way I look, like how, where's that population in Salt Lake City. And I think as more companies are coming to Salt Lake, as more folks are moving to Salt Lake, that will come. But I think it's having those conversations with people and making introductions, right? Are there things that we can 
can we send you on a school tour? Can we send you on, can you spend the weekend here? Can you have all of these types of things like getting folks in so they, they can come and get a sense for Salt Lake City is incredibly important. Um, but also on that flip side, also just ensuring that a recursion is an inclusive place so that when, if and when folks do move here, they can bring their true authentic self here and that they can put their best foot forward as they're working um, towards our mission. Absolutely. So, yeah. I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Utah Department of Commerce, uh, for bringing us on. <laughs> Visit saltlake.com. It's a great <laughs> website. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I And that's where, James, I'm kidding, but I'm like, I, growing up here, I was always like, I have to leave, right? But yeah. I love Salt Lake. Utah is such a great place. Um, okay. Great sense of community. Um, companies like Recursion are kind of changing the landscape. So it's, Recursion's great. Salt Lake's great. So. Absolutely. But, but if you're hiring in Cambridge, you're hiring in South San Francisco, like I imagine there's a lower level of risk taking this leap to say, okay, I'm going to move from wherever the heck I am. I just graduated school from university of wherever the heck I'm going to go to one of these two places. It, and if I have that moment of, okay, my boss is a jerk. I hate working here. I don't like what I, what this process is. There's something relatively close. There are options. There's a level of optionality that, Going to a Denver, going to an Austin, going to a Seattle, going to a Salt Lake City doesn't offer. So how does that lack of optionality change the conversation in recruiting? Uh, you know, the, the duration of time, does it change how long it takes to kind of close that deal to make that happen? I mean, how does ge geographic, that lack of geographic optionality change your process? Yeah. And that's, we do have folks that are kind of that same question around like, you know, if I'm in Cambridge, I'm within tech bio, I'm like four, I could throw something and I'm hitting four yeah, companies, exactly, right? So exactly. why would I come and there's only a handful in Salt Lake City? And I think it changes the conversation around like, yes, there is risk, but like, it's worth the risk. Like we are driving, we are disrupting an industry. We are making change right here to get drugs to patients faster. Like this is why you want to come here. Um, and disrupting the status quo. There's a lot of those companies that may be in those larger areas that are kind of mm -hmm. like, this is the way we do it. This is the way drug discovery has always been. Like it takes 10 years to do all those kind of things. So having those conversations around like, Hey, James, aren't you tired of that? Isn't that slow? Like, come here, we move quick. Let's change yep. this. Like we're going to disrupt this and move things forward. I think that's one Two, I think is also, you know, all of those things I was just mentioning around Salt Lake city around why folks want to come here. Um, and then also helping folks understand that like, they're not just going to be a number here. They can truly make an impact. And I think that goes a really long way. So having those conversations with folks that it's like, we're not just like the other handful of companies that you're going to see in South San Francisco or Cambridge, we're different. And this is why, and, and hiring managers are having those conversations. Recruiters are having those conversations to kind of highlight this is why we're different. This is the impact you're going to make. Yeah. And we're in Salt Lake City, but this is why Salt Lake City is great as well. So it's kind of this domino effect as you're leading folks into mm -hmm. that. Um, and then from that perspective, you know, we have incredible programs that will help folks relocate. We can have, like I was mentioning, come out, spend the weekend, get to know the city. Um, here's a list of 50 restaurants. Here's a list of 50 schools. Here's a list of 50 neighborhoods to go into. And I think that changes the game as well as like, that folks aren't just going to land here in Salt Lake City and they're by themselves. Like, here's a sense of community. Like, we have a bunch of Slack channels internally that you can get to know folks. There's mixers. There's all those kind of things. And so I think it's there's a large piece of it that you're moving folks there as well and having those types of conversations just to because that's the that's the hardest part. I think moving, you're dumped not dumped somewhere, but you land somewhere that you. You don't know anybody. It's a brand new job. You're like, where am I going to go? What's going to yeah. happen? And so I think creating that sense of community and just we're here, we're here, we've got you. People are our biggest asset. We're going to hear, we're here to help you move forward. And like, that's, and folks here are going to help as well, um, yeah. that you're not just going to be by yourself. We're going to help you out. So I think it's interesting that you kind of started by saying, look, if we're disrupting this industry, you, you made this connection without saying it, you know, outright, but that you can't disrupt in the place where everybody already is. If you're going to disrupt, you kind of have to be on the, the fringes. You have to be in a different spot. Um, you know, the, the, you know, Van Gogh did not go to Paris to paint amazing work. Van Gogh had to go way the hell out to, you know, to wherever the hell, um, to right. Arles, you know, Arles or whatever it is. Um, that there is kind of a connection to the brand that it is, it, it, it shows that recursion's DNA is to disrupt, is to try new things, is the willingness to look at, 
what everybody looks at it and say, I bet there's another way to do that. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that absolutely. valid? Absolutely. I would say that's absolutely valid, right? That I think there are, you know, logistical reasons why we're in Salt Lake City. But I think if you boil everything down, James, like that's a big piece of it. We're not like the others. We're not like, we're not just another South San Francisco tech bio biotech company. We're not in Cambridge for this reason. Like we're, we're here for a reason. There's incredible talent here. We want to relocate incredible talent here and we are going to change this game. Um, that I think if you boil everything down, like that's a great way to put it is like, we're, we're not like the other folks and that's why we're not on yeah. in those big coastal cities. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I think in biotech, one of the biggest challenges to prove how you're not like everybody else and you kind of have a baked in, I mean, we're not in the obvious places. We're doing something different. It suggests that it informs the idea that the th different thinking is happening, which I think is, is an interesting mm -hmm. approach. And I, I know that, you know, when I first started looking at recursion, it's like, why? It sounds like, oh, that makes it so much harder. But the truth is it can be leveraged to support a larger brand of disruption, creative thinking, that sort of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that is, that is a big piece of who we are is that kind of disruption moving at our pace, adaptability, like all of those kind of things. And so finding folks that are comfortable with that, mm -hmm. wanting to relocate here, having those comfort, like that's the type of folks that do well here. Okay. So last question. Um, yes. and you're coming from a talent ops area. So it's, it's kind of an interesting question. Um, okay. I'm going to hand you a magic wand. You get to add either a new tool or a new process mm -hmm. Or, you know, just you can change one thing to make recruiting at Recursion better. What's the thing you would want to change first? One thing? One thing. One thing? So you, you, you are, you are Ooh, good James, at what you do, but a... you are not a Superman. So all you can do is I one know. thing. One, if I were to make recruiting better at Recursion, what would it be? Oh, wow. I, I've really gotten a good one here. You stumped me. You, yeah. you got me because... Oh, we have great, we've got great pipelines. I love the systems we're using. Um, oof, such a hard question. Um, I, I, I'm going to ask this question of other people as we do this. I'm going to be fascinated to see either, either this response is kind of like, I'm really happy with what we got, or it's going to be like, oh I, man, I can only pick one here. Let me show you the laundry list of things I want to do. That's it's right. going to be the, you know, one of the two answers. It's going to be interesting. And that's where it's so, and it's, it's interesting, James, because it's so, I love recursion for the perspective of like, we will try things like, Hey, here's a, here's an idea. Here's good, crazy, bad, whatever. Here's an idea. Mm -hmm. Let's try it. And if it works, we're going to move forward. And so it's like throughout the two and a half years I've been here, it's like, there are things that I want to change. I'm going to, ch let's change them. Let's try them. And maybe it's going to work. Maybe it's not going to work. And so it's like, so it doesn't feel like so an insurmountable work wall. It doesn't feel like, Oh, I got one shot. Like you're always changing. We're always evaluating okay. and always changing. And I think that's where my, like I'm stumped because we, there's not anything that I would be like, that is what keeps me up at night. Like that's the issue mm. because we've been able to, you know, I've had incredibly supportive leaders. We have an incredibly supportive team. That's like, yeah, let's try that. And if it doesn't work, we'll pivot back to what it was or we'll try something else. And so like, I would, there are not like glaring red, big pain points right now for okay. our process within talent acquisition. It feels like we're kind of a well-oiled machine. And I don't want that to sound like, oh, everything's perfect and rainbows and unicorns. Cause it's not. But it's like we've got things moving in the right direction and we are always evolving, right? I have conversations this afternoon around like, let's try this process or let's add this survey or let's do these types of things. Like it's something I challenge my recruiters on almost weekly around like, okay, let's try it. Let's, let's do it. Let's do something different. Let's just jump in and lean in. And so that's where that kind of like, hmm. Yeah. I don't know what it would be. I think that's where that comes from, James. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let me ask this question. It's my last question then. What's one thing okay. you've implemented or learned in the last year that you think other people would find valuable? Other people in your position? Yeah, I think there is a big piece, you know, and we've talked a lot around um, kind of systems, thinking of recruiting as a system uh, systems function. Automatic stage transitions has changed the game for us. We leverage oh. our ETS system so that, you know, there used to be a big heavy lift right at the front of our funnel where our coordinators were involved in every step of the process. We have in, implemented in our, we use Greenhouse as our ATS. We have leveraged stage transitions all the way up to the panel that our, our coordinators do not have to get involved mm. until the panel process, which is pretty incredible because it frees them up. They are not just so heads down and doing everything scheduling that it frees them up to do 
maybe some project management work, maybe some work around visas, if that's where they're wanting to stretch, maybe mm -hmm. some work around data management, if that's where they're getting to go, rather than just like my, as a coordinator, my next step is obviously a recruiter. So this is what I'm going to keep doing, but it's freed them up to do so much more exploratory work in addition to some of the other work that we're wanting to do on the team. So that, that is, I just had a former colleague, James, that we used to work with. He implemented Greenhouse. And that was the first thing I told him about six months ago. I was like, you have to turn on these stage transitions <laughs> um, because it has truly, it's faster, it's a better candidate experience, and it's freed up our team, which is really nice. Interesting. So Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect way to end. Daniel, thank you so much for wasting time talking to me. Uh, always. No such thing. Oh, uh, well, it's always thrilling to catch up and I love hearing what you're doing and I love that you're coming at it from a, an atypical background. So I think that that perspective can help other people kind of say, oh, that's interesting how they're doing it. I wonder how we can, you know, either steal some ideas or try some new things. So Daniel, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for talking with of me. Of course. Thanks, James. Thanks for having me. Have a good one. All right. Thanks everybody. And we'll see you next time. Bye y'all.